This presentation is covering research involving unsupervised clustering of National Science Foundation funding proposal abstracts. My name is Jacob Noble. I have an undergrad degree in physics. I spent some years doing material science and currently I am a software engineer on an AI operations team within a data science department. And I am Himan Sukhamit. I studied computer science in my undergrad. I have about five plus years of software engineering experience and currently I am a data science intern and we are both data science graduate students at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Now to understand the importance of this research better, we must go back to 1950. In 1950, to utilize taxpayers dollars in an efficient way, the National Science Foundation got created by Congress. This meant to promote the progress of science and advance the nation's health, prosperity, welfare, and to improve national defense. NSF is vital because they support basic research and people to create knowledge that transforms the future of the nation. They fund advanced instrumentation and facilities, including posts in Antarctica and other national research laboratories. Besides, as a researchers ourselves, we are familiar with the time, dedication and hard work required to not just study a topic, but also to find relevant studies to build upon, which led us to investigate the National Science Foundation data to find out how research gets funded. They evaluate about 50,000 proposals each year, with the year 2020 funding budget being $7.1 billion. This funding will go on to support about eight to 12,000 research grants for many grad students and postdocs. The data collected from the NSF included about 330,000 funding proposals going back to 1985, which is about 34 years now. This data was acquired through the NSF Awards API. We brought a Python wrapper around a REST API to establish a data pipeline to collect newly funded proposals. Each proposal from the API included information regarding the awardee, agency, and funding information such as the funding date and funding amount. What was interesting to us was that the API also provided proposal abstracts. These are the abstracts used in this study. Now, how much effort do you think it would take for NFS to review and choose as many as 12,000 proposals? Well, it does take a large amount of manual effort to evaluate about 50,000 research proposals each year. And to assess the invaluable quality of the proposal, NSF follows strict guideline called merit review process. This determines the intellectual merit and the broader impact of a research proposal. And you know, each proposal requires multiple reviewers that are expert in their specific field. And in addition, the proposals must be compared to previous and current research. And the reviewers must determine which proposals will have the greatest potential and be the most fruitful investment for taxpayers' dollars, which creates the challenges related to scalability, consistency of the project waiting across awardees, and the identification of projects which require special assistance. Clearly, this effort does not scale well. So how can we use these proposal abstracts? And here, we set out to develop a method for grouping similar proposals together based on its context. And that will help reviewers identify similar proposals to the ones they are reviewing based on textual context from the past 330,000 proposal abstracts. Before we can do any real analysis on the proposal abstracts, we have to first transform that abstract into numerical data that can be processed by a machine learning model. To do that, we used a document to vector or doc to vec model. Before we can dive into what the doc to vec model is, we first must talk about the word to vec model. This is a neural network that tries to predict a word by using the surrounding words as input. The surrounding words are what provides the context for that prediction. In this example, I packed my blank, it is raining. It is obvious to us that the missing word here might be umbrella, but a word to vec model has to see many examples and learn from a large collection of texts before it is confident in a prediction. With enough training and textual context to learn from, it could predict that the missing word here might be umbrella based on the context, it is raining. To prepare the collection of abstracts or corpus for training this model, we first build the corpus vocabulary by assigning a number or index to each unique word. 
the word in the corpus text is then replaced with its uh, index number. This rudimentary numerical representation of the text is then used to train the word to vec model. Once the model is trained, it can be used to convert words into a high dimensional vector space or word vector. This is often referred to as a word embedding. There are many other types of word embeddings, such as bag of words or term frequency inverse document frequency, TFIDF, but these fail to capture contextual information about the words as they mainly just count how many times a word appears in a document. To properly group similar abstracts together, we need to take this a step further and embed the entire abstract or document. How do we go from word vectors to document vectors? The data prep and training process is the same. The model is still learning to predict words based on the surrounding words. The difference is that the embedding now has an additional vector attached to it that represents the document and that helps with the prediction. In our case, the document is the funding proposal abstracts. It is important to note that in both the DocToVec and WordToVec model, it is not the final prediction that we are interested in. It is actually the layers before the prediction where the words and document are transformed into vector space. These vectors are what provide the weights for the prediction and are the actual word and document embeddings. In this study, we embedded the proposal abstracts into vector space with 300 dimensions. K-means clustering is an unsupervised clustering algorithm that we use to cluster together our document vectors from the NSF proposal abstracts. K-means will group together N items into K groups based on the Euclidean distance between the points. Training the K-means clustering algorithm involves assigning data points to its nearest cluster center. The initial cluster centers are assigned at random. Once all the data points are assigned to a cluster, a new center for each cluster is calculated. The process then starts over and reassigns data points to its nearest cluster center. And this repeats until there is no significant change in the cluster center. And for this study, we clustered the document vectors into 200 clusters. Now that we know about the doc to vec model and k-means clustering, we can take a larger look at the architecture used in this study. At first, all the abstracts are fed into the doc to vec neural network to extract document embeddings. And then these embeddings or document vectors are clustered using k-means. This provides cluster of abstracts that have been grouped together based on actual context. And finally, this embedding and clustering technique can be used with the new funding proposals to identify similar proposals. After vectorizing and clustering the proposal abstracts, we look at two methods for visualizing the document embeddings. It is difficult to visualize data in 300 dimensions, so it is important to look into various dimensionality reduction techniques. Principal component analysis, or PCA, is a very common technique in machine learning. PCA projects the data in the direction of the largest variance. I like to think of this as rotating the dimension axes so that the largest spread of the data falls on an axis. This is popular because it can decrease machine learning training time by maintaining variance within the data while using less dimensions. However, we will see that it is not particularly useful for visualizing data. Another method for dimensionality reduction is the T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or T-SNE. This is a more modern technique that converts high dimensional Euclidean distance between points into conditional probabilities. This is generally not used as a data preprocessing step for machine learning as computation times tend to be much longer than PCA. However, it does work well for capturing and revealing both local and global structures within the data. This makes it very appealing and effective for visualizing a high dimensional space. Here are the two-dimensional visualizations produced by both the PCA and T-SNE techniques. Each color here represents a different cluster. As you can see, the visualization of the document vectors produced by PCA does not do a great job of showing any meaningful relationship between documents and certainly does not have any sort of cluster organization. This is because we are just seeing the two dimensions of 300 that have the largest variance. The TSNE visualization reveals both local and global relationships between documents. 
This type of visualization is useful for investigating relationships between documents within a cluster and relationships between different clusters. It takes many experiments to get a machine learning model work, and it feels even better when you get the expected outcome. Likewise, we were surprised with the outcome of our model. We took a deep dive into several clusters. It did, did not take a long time to find clusters of similar co context. Here are some titles of proposals found within a single cluster. Most of the proposals in this cluster were focused on early childhood and infant development, many of which focus on development of motor and linguistic skills. And one interesting insight about this cluster is the presence of several robotics proposals regarding infant development, which is connecting different studies together. This cluster group together research proposals dedicated to studying social behavior of women in STEM programs. One proposal here focuses on broadening women's participation in STEM, while another focuses on the pathways for introducing young women to STEM. This is a clear example of coherent cluster that could be useful for NSF reviewers as it provides better curated search results based on context when looking for funded proposals regarding women in STEM. This research was to be able to group new proposals with previously funded proposals based on similar context. So it is very important that this model can process new text so that reviewers can quickly retrieve similar proposals to help scale their manual efforts and to improve the quality of their review. And to test this, we vectorized and clustered the abstract associated with this study. The substring of this proposal is in the lab circle of the smart art. And it was interesting to see what we found. The cluster it was assigned to contain NSF funding proposals of workshops to provide news researchers and investigators information about the NSF proposal submission process. Isn't that wonderful? And this is, was a successful demonstration of our model performance. There are many other applications that this embedding and clustering technique can be applied to. This would be useful when working with large collections of similar documents, such as legal documents, healthcare claims, or even product reviews. Embedding and clustering can be applied to many other data structures aside from text. The only real limitation is a researcher's ability to embed a data object into vector space. The last few years saw great improvements in the field of natural language processing. The very popular BERT and GPT-2 models were developed and have a large amount of potential for computational language understanding. Despite the large strides made in the field over the last few years, there is still a lot of work to be done. Some additional work that could be done regarding the NSF funding proposal embedding and clustering study performed here would be to try and include the rest of the proposal data along with the document vectors to improve clustering. Some work is also required to help determine the quality of a cluster. As of now, we manually inspected clusters for coherence. However, a less subjective method would help to determine if changes to the model were actual improvements. BERT and GPT-2 could also be used to better contextual understanding of the abstracts, potentially providing better clusters. Some time series analysis could also be applied to this data set and doc to vec method for predicting funding ranges for new proposals. A lot was learned over the course of this study. This study gave us a great opportunity to explore natural language processing techniques in combination with unsupervised machine learning techniques for clustering and pattern recognition. This embedding and clustering technique has many advantages. It is capable of learning textual context. It demonstrated an ability to achieve coherent clusters. And it is capable of processing new text. However, not all the clusters were coherent or even particularly useful. Unseen words could potentially decrease the quality of the contextual understanding of new proposals. New discoveries in scientific progress are likely to produce words that the model has not seen before. And it is also a challenge to determine the quality of the clusters as the coherence of a cluster is determined subjectively. We set out here to develop a technique for improving the NSF proposal reviewer's ability to process and review new proposals. This embedding and clustering technique was successful as it does show to produce coherent proposal clusters based on textual context. Sir Isaac Newton said, if I have seen farther than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. 
This technique can help reviewers see how new proposals can help build upon the research of others. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Feel free to reach out to us at the following.